Thanks a lot for the invitation and the introduction. Uh, okay, so this talk is about learning and reasoning in AI, a bit different from the previous talk. Uh, yeah, so everybody knows that there's quite some revolutionary progress in AI, in particular machine learning, deep learning. Uh, if we look at computer vision, speech recognition, game playing, self-driving vehicles, and also language-related tasks. So yeah, just some nice images here. Uh, object recognition, so uh, we are above human performance uh, in recognizing digits, in recognizing objects on images, uh, and yeah, in some cases that may be very useful if we think uh, at uh, the healthcare domain, uh, there has been quite some progress there concerning uh, better than expert human performance in detecting skin cancer, lung cancer, eye diseases. Um, then, well, in particular in computer vision, there's a lot of uh, uh, superhuman performance and recently, uh, well, natural language is a bit harder, but recently, uh, we also have uh, some progress there. Um, so all, uh, actually, if, if we look at natural language processing tasks, I would say that nearly all tasks are nowadays um, solved with uh, deep learning approaches. Uh, here, uh, I, I have um, as first task translation, and there was, I think, last year, uh, there's this article by Microsoft Asia, I think, uh, reporting human parity on automatic Chinese to English news translation. So there have been uh, similar uh, results recently obtained for some other languages. Well, we're not, not really there yet, uh, but we see that, that um, there's substantial progress uh, in neural uh, natural language translation done. Uh, then, uh, if we think about question answering, the so Stanford question answering data set, we're already at the second version of that data, uh, of that um, data set, and um, well, at the end of March, um, the systems reached uh, human level performance on that data set. So it's about finding the answer to a question within document if one exists. So here, the second version of that data set there was also the, uh, the chance that uh, there was no answer actually in the document. Okay, but still, uh, uh, there are some problems with natural language processing. And we see that in particular if we look at, uh, well, the Winograd Schema Challenge. Um, in particular, the pronoun disambiguation problem. So it's, it's a very, very simple problem that humans are very, uh, can solve very easily. So the question here, well, that's, that's a sentence, a trophy would not fit in the brown suitcase because it was too big. What was too big? Uh, yeah, so to what is this it referring to the trophy or to the suitcase? And well, we know immediately it's referring to the trophy. Okay, one may think, well, it's about syntax here, uh, so that should be easy. It's not really about syntax, it's about understanding um, the sentence. So if we just change big by small, uh, then it's about the suitcase uh, that this is, it is referring to. Uh, so syntax alone is not enough uh, to solve this problem. And um, yeah, uh, that is currently a big problem in natural language processing. So where do we stand? Uh, uh, we currently have a success rate, that's uh, of my group, of uh, 72.5 uh, on uh, the Vinograd uh, schema challenge. Uh, so this uh, pronoun, this ambiguation tasks, uh, how, we have, how did we arrive there? Uh, well, we took uh, the BERT language model, and we fine-tuned it with uh, some other big data sets. So that's uh, basically how, how this has been done. Uh, and um, uh, yeah, actually, 
uh, Microsoft was very, a team at Microsoft was very quick to fix the idea up and uh, they have just recently reported human level performance on the Glue leaderboard uh, concerning inference in uh, natural language processing. So it's, it's a collection of data sets and uh, they, they have just reported human level performance in, in that collection of data sets. Uh, yeah, so the question is then, uh, okay, yeah, so uh, how, how do we progress here? Uh, do we just take a lot of computing power, big data sets, and uh, uh, yeah, then we can solve everything, maybe. Uh, but, but then there are some other problems with deep learning that uh, we may solve, and yeah, this, that may not be the only way how to solve it. And that's somehow what I'm trying uh, to look at in my group, with my group to uh, find uh, alternative ways of solving the, the Venugard schema challenge by combining deep learning with uh, symbolic, symbolic uh, knowledge representation. Uh, in particular, if we look at all those success stories, uh, many are actually already combinations of deep learning with uh, traditional AI techniques, uh, and then deep learning has a problem. Uh, if we think about uh, the black box behavior, well, sometimes we would like to know why certain results are coming out. Um, so uh, we would like to have interpretability and explainability. Um, then there are some other problems. Uh, you've probably heard of Amazon's problem in uh, using a machine learning model to filter out uh, job applications which was biased in the end concerning a certain group of uh, people. Uh, then if we look at uh, the recognition of objects um, uh, in images, that problem, uh, there, were, there, are some, there are some very nice examples uh, where we see that uh, the deep learning models are not always robust. Uh, then another problem is that, that normally we need quite large data sets. So it would actually be nice if we can use some domain knowledge and mix it uh, with the data sets uh, so that, yeah, we can use smaller data sets and do the learning in that way. And so that's somehow the idea to combine deep learning uh, with traditional AI techniques, in particular logic-based knowledge representation and reasoning techniques. Okay, yeah, so what type of techniques do I have in mind? Uh, yeah, knowledge graphs, that's nice. Actually, uh, a lot of companies are uh, using knowledge graph as a uh, uniform way of representing knowledge. Uh, and uh, yeah, that may be one form of um, uh, representing knowledge in a structured way. So what is that actually? Well, we have entities and then we have uh, uh, binary relations uh, between those entities and that's it. Right, so uh, not really very complex. Uh, looks nice here in that image, uh, but, but um, even uh, uh, less complex than relational databases where uh, our relations uh, uh, may, may be larger than uh, just uh, uh, two, two entries. Uh, so uh, but actually, in AI, in knowledge representation and reasoning, people have worked on quite a number of formalisms um, to represent knowledge, for example, rules, right? So these, these are rules uh, <coughs> representing uh, relationships um, um, between uh, objects. Uh, so actually, this is picked up uh, from um, the data log query languages over databases. So the idea is, well, we have a database with some base relations here on the left, uh, and then we have other relations that we derive from these base relations. Uh, yeah, so here, for example, person and managers. Um, so, and using these rules, uh, we get a number of uh, tuples uh, that we can de derive from um, uh, the original database. And, and then uh, the query answering is, is done on, uh, yeah, so the original database plus those tuples that I've, we have derived. Uh, so here there are some formal queries 
uh, one uh, about um, asking whether there are um, employees that are managing someone uh, via a third person, or here whether there are symmetric um, um, pairs in the manager's relation. Uh, so the first evaluated on uh, these facts uh, turns out to be true, second one false. Uh, yeah, so these, these are some uh, simple uh, cases of, of knowledge. Uh, here, data log, then there have been some extensions of data log towards logic programming, uh, then with um, uh, default negation, that's one direction, and another direction is uh, in uh, ontology languages, um, and for example, description logics. Uh, yeah, so uh, one idea could be to add, uh, well, facts plus additional background knowledge. Uh, and it's, uh, so, and to use that in addition to data sets for the learning process. Uh, so, yeah, what do we get from our logic-based, standard logic-based AI systems? Uh, well, we have a language, so that helps to interpret um, what we encode. Um, and, um, well, we can also somehow define question answering and analytics in a more declarative way. Uh, then, uh, yeah, actually, uh, since concerning our question answering, well, that is based on these facts in uh, those base relations plus um, the facts that we can derive via the rules. So uh, for any answer here, we can find the rules that we have applied and those facts that were in the original database that we have used to, do, to answer that question positively. So yeah, we get explanations actually for, for the out, outcomes. And as I've already said, we may then use uh, the logic-based domain knowledge to substitute uh, the, the data sets so that we can learn from smaller data sets. <coughs> and yeah, so where's the, the role of deep learning? Uh, well, deep learning allows us uh, to extract structured data from multimodal unstructured sources. Uh, so we've seen that, that image data in the beginning. And actually then, uh, well, even if we have structured data, normally there are some problems with that data, especially if we have derived it from unstructured sources, there may be inconsistencies, there may be noise, uncertainty inside. And the idea is that deep learning can also help there uh, to form reasoning uh, in such contexts. So yeah, so that's somehow my idea of an AI system where we combine deep learning and symbolic knowledge representation and reasoning. So deep learning here on, uh, oops. Uh, here on that side to extract structured knowledge uh, from uh, diverse sources of data, so images, for example, video, sensor data, text, and also here on that side, deep learning to perform reasoning uh, from our internal knowledge base. So here that's our internal knowledge base. Uh, so yes, uh, we somehow refer to some um, symbolic language, uh, but actually what I would like to do is to represent our symbolic knowledge in the vector space uh, so that uh, our question answering and analytics can then done, be done in the vector space. And yeah, so uh, in, in that way we also get interpretability uh, because all that is with respect to a symbolic language. Uh, well, explainability, uh, if uh, uh, there are some rules underlying our question answering, then we can use those rules uh, that we have used to answer certain questions, plus the facts uh, that uh, yield to cer certain answers and to, to uh, justify why certain results are coming out. And since in the same time uh, we have, uh, well, some descriptive, uh, uh, some uh, more, um, so, so symbolic descriptions, they also lead to uh, a better results concerning fairness and robustness. So it's not only examples uh, that we are looking at and, and that are describing the outputs. So it, 
we are also describing what we would like to have in a symbolic way. And so I, I've personally worked on, uh, well, nearly all these images, videos, uh, especially on extracting structured data from text. And uh, yeah, so uh, then later in, in this talk, I will uh, talk about a normal approach that uh, my group has, uh, has developed here uh, concerning uh, the question answering. So maybe one example, this is a general architecture actually, right? So we can use it actually for many different applications. Uh, so one, one area where we're, I would like to use it for uh, is uh, natural language processing in the legal domain. Uh, so uh, yeah, what do we have to do there? Well, we have to search for relevant documents. Then we have to extract uh, relevant knowledge out of those documents and to perform legal reasoning and analytics on the results. So that's, that's uh, yeah, where such architecture fits very well. Uh, so what types of use cases can we look at? Well, we think about legal contracts to check whether there are inconsistencies, uh, whether there are loopholes in contracts, uh, then to look at uh, legal cases, um, uh, concerning uh, the outcome of, of legal cases to predict uh, uh, the outcome and, um, well, to build up a case. Uh, then we may also think uh, about some simple cases um, that were, uh, uh, rather than looking at what the judge is doing, uh, a system may just uh, uh, do some negotiation between people, so an automated uh, law in a way and of course, um, uh, lawyers are very expensive and if we want to get some legal advice, it would be good to have a system uh, that helps us uh, giving us legal advice and then uh, uh, pointing us uh, to the relevant uh, lawyers uh, for our problems in case it makes sense uh, to follow them. Yeah, so this is one uh, application uh, for such uh, AI systems where we combine deep learning and symbolic techniques. Uh, yeah, then uh, let me look at this. Uh, we look at this part here. Uh, so I pick again up uh, this, um, uh, yeah, the data log context. Uh, so what we are trying to do is, um, well, there exists um, uh, for Several decades, people have worked on ontology reasoning, um, in particular in description logics. And uh, yeah, what about just picking up uh, that problem and model it with deep learning? Uh, okay, so let's take a slightly easier problem here, the one from the beginning, uh, just something like that. Uh, so how, how can we model it uh, with um, a neural network system? Uh, so, yeah, from, from a formal uh, point of view, uh, well, it's some logical theory, right? So uh, these are just facts and, and these are logical formulas, those rules. Uh, I've written them or normally one writes them uh, without uh, all this uh, clutter here, those universal quantifiers. Yeah, so the variables are actually universally quantified and uh, uh, those uh, facts that has been infer that have been inferred uh, are uh, logical consequences uh, of uh, these facts and and those rules. Uh, where well, that's also the least fixed point. So there's quite quite some theory behind. Uh, so yeah, how how can we uh, realize uh, a reasoner that is evaluating such queries based on um, uh, the original facts and those derived facts. So basically the neural network should derive those facts. And uh, yeah, so this is what, what we want. Um, so uh, in general, well, we have some, some database or, or in description logic terminology that's also called ABOX. 
Uh, then we have some additional rules, in general much more complex than those that I've shown, um, that is describing the ontological relationships, it's also called T-box in description logics, and we are executing our query uh, on this database via uh, the ontology. Um, and in particular, what we have been looking at is at the old 2 RL language. Uh, so what about uh, 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 evaluating conjunctive queries um, over a relational database uh, within that language? Can we replace it by a neural network? So that was the question. Uh, so here, yeah, another simple example. Uh, mother-father relations uh, and uh, based on um, uh, those in the ontology we derive uh, the parent relations and the ancestor relations and some queries that we may answer is uh, Mary, uh, an ancestor of Tim, uh, what are the descendants uh, of, of Mary and uh, what are the grandparents of Tim Okay, yeah, so how uh, do we turn that into a neural network? How do we realize it uh, with uh, a neural network? Uh, well, um, so, okay, so we have uh, relations here, uh, mother, father, and those derived relations, uh, parent and ancestors. And for those, we use uh, multi-layer perceptrons. And then we have objects here. Uh, so those, uh, Mary, John, David, Tim, uh, will be just represented um, by points in the vector space. Oops. Okay. Uh, and this is what this here is saying. Uh, yeah, so those in green and blue, those are uh, the objects. Um, that are uh, represented by points in the vector space and then for each predicate we have a multi-layer perceptron and we are learning well we start uh, by initializing those uh, encodings of the objects randomly and then uh, we walk through all um, uh, the facts that we have in the database uh, and adapt um, the embeddings of the uh, objects and uh, of the multi-layer perceptrons uh, for um, the predicates. Okay. So, uh, yeah, there's one restriction that we are currently only looking at atomic queries, so not conjunctive queries yet. Um, and so those embeddings for the objects, they then encode all the information that we have about the individuals. So uh, both the facts that are directly in the database and those facts that can be inferred. Uh, so starting from the random embeddings, we walk uh, through all uh, the database facts and um, we take uh, uh, the, the current facts that we are looking at and uh, we look uh, take uh, all uh, what we have encoded in, in uh, the embedding of an individual uh, and um, update the embedding of the, the individual by uh, these facts and anything that follows from uh, the two. Uh, so here there, there is an example how one can think of that. Uh, so uh, parent relations, uh, so these are the, the pairs uh, above um, that uh, we want to represent. So we need an embedding of all the objects uh, that are occurring here. So Della, Louis, Hortense, and Don Donald. Uh, and uh, then we have to learn a multi-layer perceptron uh, for the parent of relation. Uh, so yeah, so then we go uh, through these pairs and we adapt uh, the embeddings. So here we see uh, suddenly uh, Della turns out to be a parent of Louis. That's what uh, is expressed here by the fact that it is above Louis. Uh, then we take uh, the next pair and adapt um, the um, embedding of Hortense. And finally, the last uh, uh, pair to 
adapt, slightly adapt uh, Hortensi and uh, Donald's embedding. Uh, and once we have uh, done that, uh, until we've reached uh, convergence, uh, then we will have uh, the embeddings of those individuals and uh, we have uh, neural networks encoding uh, the parent of relation um, that can then be used uh, to answer the question, so is Donald an uncle of Louis, for example. Yeah, so, so these are very simple examples here, right? Uh, does that work in general with bigger data sets? Yes, it does actually. Um, okay, so we use the toy data sets like these, uh, but um, uh, where we have in particular long chains of inference. So that is normally a problem with uh, deep learning models. Uh, this multi-hop reasoning, how it's <laughs> called in machine learning as well. Uh, well, uh, is it possible to model that? Uh, yes, it is possible. So uh, we have generated uh, data sets uh, with long inference chains uh, and uh, large amounts of data. Uh, so family trees, uh, country data sets, DBpedia and uh, Claros. Uh, and uh, well, there are quite a number of objects um, and relations in uh, those data sets. Uh, and uh, it turned out that um, uh, we were able to learn uh, very precisely reasoning. Uh, so uh, close uh, one or close to one, uh, the accuracies here. Uh, then in particular, this is something that uh, I was mentioning in the beginning, why do we actually do that? Uh, uh, yes, because uh, we may handle the cases where we have inconsistencies, uncertainties, incompleteness, and um, uh, we looked at um, uh, such cases, and indeed, uh, they can be handled very well. Uh, missing and conflicting information will just be added. Um, so the a preliminary report, we're currently working on a more detailed report, is uh, available online. Uh, yes? Can you tell us about, a bit more about what the relations look like in DBpedia and Claros? Um, so, basically everything, uh, it was these types of data here, right? A anything that was, so, unary and binary relations, uh, and rule-based knowledge uh, with unary and binary uh, predicates, uh, and, uh, well, in the end we were just interested in atomic theories. So a, a large number of relations? Yes, yes, a large number of relations, yeah. And there are also relations that are more subjective, because those obviously are very objective. I mean, someone is a parent or, uh, or someone else, and they can not be disputed. But if you have sources that are somehow conflicted, uh, which one do you tend to trust? Uh-huh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so... Missing information, inconsistencies here, we have only looked into uh, removing some facts or adding some facts that result, uh, adding that result into inconsistencies, basically. So, so uh, yeah, so that's, that's how we tested that. Uh, but I have to say, I mean, that's not a paper about um, focusing on how good it is on, on, on replacing on adding missing information or um, um, removing inconsistencies. So it, it was um, a paper, it's a paper about showing that it's actually possible to do symbolic reasoning uh, with neural networks. That was, was, was what it was about. So. Uh, yeah, future work, so there's still a lot missing uh, okay, accuracy I think is, is pretty good, uh, but um, so this is um, actually already the second implementation of, of that approach, um, where uh, we were only focusing on the accuracy. We have a first um, uh, implementation uh, which is less accurate, uh, but uh, which has a much um, 
uh, lower learning time. Uh, so there, uh, compared to symbolic reasoners, uh, we found cases where we are 100 times quicker. Uh, then, uh, yeah, that's a very small, uh, simple language that we have used here. So how can we expand it to more expressive ontology languages? So in uh, the description logic and ontology languages domain, there are very expressive languages that, that are used. Uh, how can we expand it uh, to that uh, languages? Uh, how can we expand it to other forms of language, of, of reasoning? So default reasoning, for example. Um, then uh, what we haven't done yet is to actually generate those explanations. But since uh, the reasoning is based on the rules, uh, so uh, the neural network somehow represents the rules, right? So it, um, uh, it, it should be possible to uh, retract the rules from somehow from the network. Um, so, uh, therefore, uh, it should be easily possible to get those explanations uh, why certain results are uh, coming out, uh, but that is not realized yet in that paper. Uh, and um, yeah, so that, that approach also works without rules, just picking up uh, the data and, and um, uh, detecting, predicting relationships between data and um, yeah, an interesting aspect is then, well, um, can we induce uh, the rules that we used um, or that implicitly hold in certain data uh, and that is also an um, aspect of future research. Yeah, so concerning this deep learning uh, for ontology reasoning approach and uh, yeah, maybe summarizing uh, so uh, I wanted um, to introduce, well, m maybe more the main ideas, not the technicalities. The technicalities can be find, uh, found in the paper, so uh, both for the Vinograd Schema Challenge, so the language model uh, that we have trained uh, is, is online, as well as um, for the uh, deep learning for ontology reasoning approach. Uh, but it's about combining deep learning and no logic-based knowledge representation towards more interpretability, explainability, fairness, and robustness. Um, and uh, well, that's a general architecture actually. So uh, um, I've mentioned um, um, natural language processing in the legal domain, but uh, actually I'm also using it uh, for fake news detection. Uh, yes, uh, text understanding and common sense reasoning uh, is also an, a goal. Uh, that we want to reach with this approach. Uh, so somebody was, uh, yeah, so this may be interesting for, for the organizers. Uh, how, how can we use that in finance too, for predictions? Um, and uh, well, uh, some other application areas in healthcare, for example, or um, uh, if we look at sensor networks for smart cities or industrial applications. So it's introducing a symbolic layer, coupling it with deep learning, and in, in that way we have uh, some, some nice uh, properties here. Yeah, thank you very much for your attention.